you have an idea, you have to create the mental model in which the world is an absurdity in the absence of it. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. You are the person who is listening, and that was former sound technician, bartender, singer, songwriter, and current entrepreneur, Benji Rogers, on the power of a good idea and building models. Before our conversation last month at the Ludlow House in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Benji and I had met once before. Seven years ago, a mutual friend set up a meeting for the two of us. At the time, I don't think either one of us really understood why we were meeting apart from the fact that a trusted friend thought we'd get along. That first time we met, Benji came into the studio where I was working in Tribeca and we traded stories. He came from a music business family in England. His parents and stepdad were all in the music business as managers and musicians. Benji's own musical career had started early as a teenager, first interning at studios, then studying at music schools in the United States. He started a band and lived the dream. And when that ended, he started another band and kept dreaming, building his following and making a go of it as an active member of what he calls the creator class. That night in December of 2009, Benji showed me the website for his new business, Pledge Music, a service that would connect musical artists to their fans and allow them to crowdfund projects in exchange for access as well as premium content like signed vinyl, lyric sheets, really anything. Rather than trying to sell a finished product to a wide group of people, Pledge would allow you to reach out to your network and invite them to participate from the very start, to go on the journey with you. Plus, Benji explained to me back then, the artist would give a percentage of their profits after the production expenses had been paid to charity. The first project they did was for Benji's own band, Marwood. He was passionate about it, he was excited, he had put together a small team of partners who were deeply invested in the project as well. I didn't get it. I mean, I really didn't get it. This was, you have to understand, a more innocent time. There were basically no models, no examples of this. There was no Kickstarter, there was no Indiegogo, there was no real concept of crowdfunding. And I certainly didn't predict that it would become one of the major engines of creative and musical output less than a decade later. Maybe it's not an engine, maybe it's more like the fuel. Since that time, three million fans and 50,000 acts have used the service to get records made. It turns out it wasn't just a good idea for Marwood or developing artists. In recent years, the list of notable artists has swelled and many Grammy-winning, chart-topping projects have been launched through Pledge. At this very moment, campaigns include Dweezil Zappa, Weird Al Yankovic, Richard Thompson, Michael Bolton, Def Leppard, Robbie Williams, Gregory Porter, and closer to home, past guests on this very podcast, including on this very podcast, including Becca Stevens, Alex Cuba, and Doug Womble, have campaigns going on, as does my friend and sometimes collaborator Anya Marina. Recent guest Ari Herstand used Pledge Music for his new book about the music business, and Matt Pearson, one of my first guests, has a long-standing relationship with Pledge as well. So it's in the family. Benji and I began by talking about his life before Pledge and how he came to be 34 years old, living on an air mattress in his mom's spare room when he had the idea for Pledge. It's a great companion to my recent interviews with live music entrepreneurs in New York like Spike Wilner and Michael Dorff. But just for the fun of it, before we get started with the conversation, here's a little taste of that first Pledge music campaign album from Benji's own Marwood project. This is London Summer. London summer lasted all day long You pulled me out of the darkness You pulled me out of the darkness I'm thinking it's not all that sad No, it's not real Former job was putting body mines on people. Well, you gotta get right. So, how do I look? Does that look right? It's a seven. 
It's a seven. Is it a, seven. It's a solid seven. I once had to body Mike Rodney Dangerfield's wife, and she was wearing, <laughs> and the makeup lady came up to me before you we were about to go on and said, just so you know, she's wearing a $10,000 silk dress. You cannot put a pin in it. And so Rodney's like, like pushing me saying, hey, kid, you checking out my wife? You checking out my wife? <laughs> a hundred Rodney Dangerfield jokes just come to mind. I asked the cab driver to take me where the action was. He took me back to my own house. <laughs> My wife told me I was one in a million. It turns out I really was one in a million. <laughs> okay, so you have mentioned in the last five minutes a series of jobs that you had in your former life, including bartender and microphone technician. Audio 2, A2, yeah. Video director. I've done a live, live cameraman for on stage for live performances of concerts. I've had a variety of jobs, including my first job, which was as a tape op audio assistant at the old Trident Studios that became Audio One in London. Uh, I think when I was 14, for my summer holiday, something like that, yeah. But that doesn't come as such a surprise because you grew up in a not only musical family, but a kind of technical musical family. Yeah, the son of three managers, mother, father, stepfather. So um, my earliest memories are of being, and my father was a musician, so my earliest memories of being, um, you know, at various uh, um, country and Western concerts uh, around England. My dad was in a few bands. One was called the Bottle City Rockets. Uh -huh, the other yeah. was called the Hank Wangford Band. Hank's an interesting guy, actually. He's a, um, a gynecologist, worked for the National Health Service in England and treated Graham Parsons. Huh when his wife was unwell and then when he was unwell. He's also, I believe, president of the Nude Mountaineering Society and um, a singer-songwriter. And his last, his last tour was called No Hole Too Small. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he went around, around the UK. But when my dad was playing with him, the hit was Cowboys Stay On Longer. So, uh -huh. you know, oh, wow. So I was, anyway, when I was a baby, I was literally like at those gigs. And right. my, mom worked, my mom worked for Seymour Stein and for Sire and you, know, you uh -huh. name it, um, everyone from she worked for Van Halen back in the day, yeah. at Warner's, and I've never not been around musicians, never not been in studios, never not been kind of in some way, shape, or form around, uh, around it. I mean, I see how you are familiar with musicians and the music life, but it also gives me a sense that early on, the business of music was demystified. You understood who these players were that defined the way the music was yeah. distributed, disseminated, produced, you know, because I think that piece of it is actually a bit mysterious to the typical musician who comes to music just from uh, falling in love with records. Yeah. It, it's been a series of revelations though still because the people that I knew was you know uncle so-and-so and uncle so-and-so were like you know pretty big shots of you know some of them running labels yeah. right now. Um, the big ones. I guess here's what I always knew. They were never the dumbest person in the room. Mm -hmm. Never. And none of them got to the top of those big companies by accident. Th these are smart savvy people. But I also got to see, you know, sort of my mother was an amazing entrepreneur in the business. You know, she started her own record label back in, you know, the 90s. She also invested early on in a company called Res Rocket Surfer, which is basically like pre-cloud Pro Tools over uh -huh. the internet. But my sort of technical excitement didn't really switch on until I saw MySpace for the first time. First time I saw MySpace, I, I was in the first 100,000 profiles to sign up. And I remember just this light went off and I was like, and I said, if they add an audio player to, my, to my, my band at the time, I said, if they add an audio player, this will become radio. This is what radio will look like. It'll be a profile of that artist with some tracks that you can listen to and then comments and on and on. It was like that early social network. Um, and I gamed MySpace ridiculously. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I remember getting an email from MySpace saying, you were in our first 100,000 users. You know, I remember emailing Tom and Tom emailing back. Um, <laughs> You know, I think I own a bourbon. But that part of my brain switched on around early MySpace era because I suddenly saw that the, 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 the metrics that you would base a, a traditional record on were not going to be relevant. And, not, and certainly not trackable in that world. Well, ironically, they would be trackable, but, I mean, this is what I'm doing now in, yeah. in the blockchain, but like, they would be trackable if you chose to leave a breadcrumb Right. If you chose to create that ability. And what I was stunned by, I mean, I remember once an A&R guy reached out to me and he's like, man, I see you're getting some serious MySpace numbers. Yeah. And not thinking, I just said, well, check back tomorrow. You'll see some even more serious ones because I was just literally running a script that would boost my play counts to like four million. That's very funny. 
Um, but it was so young at the time. Yeah, I, look, it got me the meeting. And so I've always had a lot of the layers demystified, but it wasn't until starting Pledge and really digging in that I got the, the front-facing A&R slash business affairs slash do deals with people. And now they've gone into the right space and the blockchain. Now I'm seeing a whole other yeah. side to it, which is the, the metadata it's an extraordinarily interesting thing to witness up close. I'm sure, and it does seem that the frame that you're looking at is expanding and expanding again. Before we talk about it, I just kind of want to settle a little bit into, you know, what your life was like before that. I mean, what was your band like? What were you doing? Best band in the world. What was it me? like? I left high school when I was 15. Uh -huh. I moved to L.A. to go to the Grove School of Music. And then I went to Berkeley when Grove was having financial issues. When I was at Berkeley, it was when I first started like writing songs and, and playing and, and kind of getting there. And I met my co-founder of Pledge there, before Pledge was even a thought. I, I met him in a, in a practice room, he was a drummer. He was a really good drummer. I remember saying like, uh, waiting around afterwards, and um, I was like, hey, you're good, you should, you should join my band. He's like, you know, do you have a band? And I'm like, no, but you'll be the first member. Great, I'm writing good songs. And I played them some and he liked them. Um, the band he was rehearsing with that night signed one of the biggest record deals in like Canadian history. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and he went off to play music with, with me. You. We did nothing. Um, moved from went from Berkeley to um, upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And I think on my 19th or my 18th baby birthday, I was up there working with him on basically like being a band. And did you finish at Berkeley? Uh, no, no, no. I was there for a year. Yeah. All the greats. Yeah, uh, I, I teach a course at Berkeley now, which is interesting on it. What I'll say is, is that, is that again, you know, the friends I met there are still friends now, mm -hmm. and in particular, you know, meeting my co-founder and building, you know, and and the institutions changed a huge amount. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I just, I mean, I was 16 years old. I'm not taking it seriously, right? You know, uh, I think I turned 17 at Berkeley. Yeah. And um, you know, 16, 16 at Grove, 17 at Berkeley. At Berkeley, there was one teacher named Charlie Sorrento, voice teacher, and he was so inspiring to me. Um, he basically just was like, and this is this. I don't know how many musicians listen to this, but this was this was my lesson about showing up as a musician. Mm -hmm. He had a class called Stage Performance Techniques, and it was the first class in the morning. It was like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. I don't remember. And I was partying, so I would go out, you know, finish partying at four or five, and show up. And in Stage Performance Techniques, you would choose a song. He would play piano, you would video yourself in front of the room, and then the next week you would critique, the, everyone would critique each other's videos. So I show up and I'm cocky and I'm like this, and I, I go to sing One by U2, so mm -hmm. Achtung Baby just come out, and I go to sing One. And you know, you say love is a temple, and I croak the note. And I look over at him and he goes, well, I'm not stopping, you're not stopping, carry on. And I try it again and I croaked it again. and so. He get, makes me go through the whole song. Yeah. And at the end of it, he's like, how'd that feel to you? And I'm like, and I'm, the class is laughing. I'm just like, so embarrassed. And he's like, well, you think it's bad now? Wait till we have to watch it next week and tell you what you did wrong. That showed me. And since that day, never did I show up to a gig without having done at least a 45 minute warm up of my voice. Never did I do a radio show or a TV show without being somewhat prepared. And, and he was also one of the first teachers that ever said to me, you want to hit the note, you'll hit it. Just don't think you can't. Just know you can. Know you can. I know you can. And he gave me extra lessons and like, so, um, in one sense, he was kind of that entrepreneurial yeah. spark that basically said, you know, you got to show up ready. The creativity part is one thing, but you got to nail the crowd. You got to put the bedrock in. And I, to this day, I I do my homework on that kind of thing. You know? But I don't get the sense that you see that as specifically a musical lesson. You see that as a kind of a lesson. Life lesson. Life lesson. Yeah. Exactly. I watched, you know, when I was in bands, you know, and playing around upstate New York and playing around, you know, L.A. and whatnot. I would see the ones that made it were either just raw, utterly talented, mm -hmm. and you know, they couldn't put their pants on, but they were so good that that someone would help them put their pants yes. on. Or they were the ones that hustled and made it too. And if you want it to be a hobby, it can be a hobby for as long as you like. Mm -hmm. If you want it to be work, then it's work. And in the music industry, the tolerance for flakiness, I think it's a lot less than it used to be. I think so too, and I think in part it's because the requirements have changed. I mean, maybe the word requirement is a little bit loaded, because there are always going to be those brilliant artists. I mean, I, when it comes to 
a model like Pledge Music, I often think about Bob Dylan, and I think about what would Bob Dylan do in the face of a career that had to be built on the back of social media and yeah. engagement with fans. When there are some people who naturally produce in isolation, and that is yeah. what we love about them. Yeah. They don't meet the bar. Before we get there, not to just leave it there, because sure. I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. We're starting to approach something that I heard you say that at some point you found yourself kind of, I'm guessing kind of late 20s, early 30s, like having reached a certain crisis. You didn't know what the next move was, and that's yeah. when you had this idea for Pledge Music. Yeah, Pledge came about, um, I was 34, actually, uh -huh. so it took a long time. Yeah. I was living uh, on an air mattress in my mom's spare room. Yeah. My wife was supporting us for, for a receptionist job. And how did you end up in that situation? Through basically a series of anything to do the gig. So I, I, played, I played in bands in LA with Jace, my co-founder. Then I moved with the guitarist to England and I moved back and forth. Um, I had a free apartment in New York to live in for a while, which was awesome. And lived an extraordinarily full life, always playing music. And what I realized was that there was a certain moment where I was like, maybe this doesn't get bigger. Maybe I've like kind of reached it. And how but big I was, was it? I mean, what was I mean, it was, it was, I had about 3,000 people on my email list. I was playing, the odd show would be close to 100, but really I was Rockwood stage one sold yeah. out, stage two hustling for it. And I was not as good solo as I was with a band, but I couldn't keep a band together. And But I wouldn't, I, but nothing would have stopped me. My wife would be like, you know, that's what you do. You, you wake up and you go hustle until you make it work. So I was playing gigs all the time, but it was just not returning. I was massively in debt. When I first moved to New York, um, I spent $28,000 making my first album. Uh, at least $28,000. Where'd you do probably it? Probably thirty uh, at Dumbo Studios. With who? With Pete Robinson and John Kaplan. I spent every, you know, yeah. like, literally like I sold my, my apartment and one thing that I owned and to make an album and drink and party for, for a year. And I don't regret that because that taught me like to put out my own CDs, to go through CD Baby, to distribute, you know, all those types of things. And nothing was like, it didn't just like, I didn't fall into this, was all work. I could party and work at the same time. Like I, I, I had that drive. But um, when Pledge hit my brain was, I remember it so clearly. It's like one of those things that's become apocryphal in my head now, but I'm lying there and I'm just going like, I don't know how to make my next record. I don't know how, because I, I, I've got nowhere else to go for money. I'm, I was working freelance camera work at the time and bartending, and it was not healthy. I just wasn't feeling good. And I was suddenly like, what if a fan could pre-order the album before it's been made? And in exchange for that, you could offer them videos of, of the making of the album. I'll bet they'd pay for it. And so I looked and I found a company called, I think, Feed the Muse, and one, I think Indiegogo was early just doing film stuff. And, and Kickstarter um, wasn't Kickstarter quite wasn't, alive. Wasn't yeah. alive. And I was starting to ideate it. This is the honest truth. So basically, I had the idea, and I went and flew to Amsterdam to play at a club called Skek, S K E K. It was right at the top of the red light district, you know, by one of the canals. And um, it was my second show there. And they paid 50 euros, food and drinks. Uh, up to a certain amount, like 30 euros, I think it was in food and drinks. And I reconnected with a fan who'd seen me at a previous show, John, this guy John. And John was like, hey, um, great to see you back again. What's next for you after the gig? You know, I'd played yeah. the show, I was all sweaty, and we were, doing, we were drinking Geneva dropped in, in beer called a cup stop, which means headbutt. And we're down in these things. And I just said to him, I said, you know, I don't know, but I've had this idea for this company called Pledge Music. Um, you know, I remember like, I'd, I'd registered the, the domain, I'd done those bits, and I was, I was looking at iWeb as a way to build it. I mean, this is how back in the day it was. And I'm not a coder. And um, John was like, I'm telling the idea, and John says, wait a second. He says, I'm, I'm an IP lawyer specializing in internet. I want in. And I was like, okay. And he's like, don't tell anyone else this idea unless they've signed a non-disclosure agreement. What's well, a non-disclosure agreement, you know? And we we're just getting, I mean, hammered at this bar in, in Amsterdam. And I came back from London, kind of not, to London, not you know, broke because I'd spent all my money and, and going like, how am I going to do this? And John hit me back, you know, on Skype and we started to discuss it. He said, like, we need a business plan. Okay, never done a business plan before. And then um, I approached Jace, my co-founder, you know, um, and I was like, you've been to business school. He's like, I've almost finished business school. I'm like, well, good enough. <laughs> and I approached my friend Rupert. He, he would help people like, like fix their Macs when their Macs would go wrong, mm -hmm. like, or convert from PC to Mac, like, mm -hmm. you know. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And he was setting up a bar in, in England at the time. So that seemed like a good idea. And we basically started to sketch it out, Rupert, John, Jace, and myself. 
And then the guy that built my first ever website in 1999 when I was making my album for the Ben Rogers band, which was the, the old band, the second band was called Marwood. The, the website, when it loaded, it was a Guinness glass filling uh -huh. up and it stopped three quarters of the way and it said, good things come to those who wait. And it filled up, it was like flash loading, you know? So I, I pinged Zach and I'm like, Zach, you know, I've had this idea, you build websites. And he's like, no, no, I'm a developer. I build Ruby on Rails, I'm a database guy. And I said, great, so you can put something on the internet, right? Yeah, you can. And he, um, he said, no, I won't do it until you've raised money. And um, I'm like, wow, we're going to raise money for this? I thought you'd just do it for free and, you know, I'll give you a piece. Had you ever had to raise money for anything else before? Never, never. I understand that you didn't and probably wouldn't have even known how to at that stage go the venture capital route with this. Not a clue. Not a clue. So what we did was we sat down. We originally thought, like, maybe it would there was some ad revenue and it would be a commission-based thing, like we had no idea. Once we'd done the business plan, I sent it out to basically five friends and said, who would you send it to? You know, do you know anyone yeah. who, who raises money? One guy, my friend, he wrote back and he's like, I'd invest in this. He said, this reminds me of how Obama got elected, that kind of grassroots thing. And I was like, that's a fair point, hmm. you know? So, you know, he bought a good percentage of the company. This is also around the time I got sober as well. Uh -huh. So I was partying and helping my friend o Rupert open his bar whilst also we were, we were I didn't, so we were in the basement of this bar you know, <laughs> drinking martinis doing Skype calls and the company had never been in the same room like none of us had been in the same room I think for the first year we weren't even in the same Hadn't room. Hadn't even met. Yeah but John was the lawyer so he helped with the legal structure Rupert was helping on technical side and then Zach the developer came in Jace was there and then we brought in a guy named Malcolm Dunbar who basically the accountant that I that I met with, like, I'd never seen a PL. I didn't know what any of this stuff meant. And it was really terrifying because we I was getting no sleep. Um, but it was four of us in the basement just grinding out the hours. It was very startup. Now that I know more about startups, it was very that. But I didn't know anything. It was a master feat of improvisation. We were, we were sitting at a board meeting. You know, so uh, uh, you know, you know, what is it? What, what you know? What are we thinking? EBITDA here? I'm like EBITDA, <laughs> googling on my phone. But what I found was, and this is this is why I, I love to be an advisor to other companies as I am now, is I got so much help from so many amazing people. And when someone said to me, "What's your mission statement?" I said, "I have no idea." Went away with the weekend, wrote, wrote, and I came back, and I was like, "Our job is to get as much money into the hands of artists in the shortest possible time." Any delay to that is a threat to our business. And I said, because things can be excellent, they have to be. And the third was, we're not subject to what was, only to what works. This is your mission statement. You know, that was the, at the time, that was the mission statement that I wrote when, the, when our, our chairman had asked it. And I mean, I'd never been on the board. I remember the first time I was like, well, we'll form a subcommittee. I'm like, there's only five of us in the room here. Yeah. Like, you know. But as it started to grow, that's when it got serious. It got intense, you know. I still look back at those emails, I'm like, who is this guy? What's he talking about? Benji Rogers reaching deep within himself and emerging with the idea that because things can be excellent, they have to be. By the way, as I talked to Benji, I found myself Googling EBITDA. It stands for Earnings Before Interest, Tax, Depreciation, and Amortization. It's a measure of a company's operating performance. So, you know, there's that. Folks, although the mission statement at the third story is a bit less defined than the one Benji developed for Pledge, and the only real interest we generate here is human interest, you can invest as much time as you want at third-story.com. Sign up, tune in, hang out, and hear the stories of risk, reward, improvisation, intuition, and plain old dumb luck. Remember how I told you that I didn't really understand the concept when Benji first explained it to me? I somewhat sheepishly rehashed that with him in our conversation and explored some of the reasons I was misguided lo those many years ago. So this leads me to w my memory of meeting you. Because yep. I think we've really only met one time. Yep. And it was seven years ago last week. Seven years ago last week. Wow. And my memory... It was in the first six months? Yes, then? it first was. seven months. Wow. And my that memory cool. of the conversation, and now that I understand that Kickstarter also was in its infancy and so it was a concept that was just foreign, I remember being skeptical, not understanding why there was a need for it. I mean, I really think my intuition was totally off on it, and it took me a long time to understand it. I also remember that there was a charitable component that was yep. much more in the forefront yep. of the initial pitch. Yep. And I think that at the time, I was a little bit distracted by that, and it seems that that was a big part of the statement initially, and it had to recede a little bit yeah. in order to make the thing happen. One of the reasons we wanted, in my initial thought on it, 
In 2004, I went and worked with refugees in the Middle East, and I was, I was really changed by that. And so I said that the next piece of music I make, or the next record I make, is going to have a component to it that, will, that I want to give back. And, and the concept was that the artist could go to their fans to raise the funds to do the records, reward them with this experience, and any profits that they made from that could be given 25% to a charity. Because if you're in the the black, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, and it's a good thing to do. That was a hard one. And, and looking back now, it complicated the message. At the same time, I remember seeing Kickstarter come out the gate. I remember looking at it, and their site was beautiful. Their tagline was good. Ours was like a mishmash of like, and it was all black, and it was like, you know, it was really like, we never had a product, we didn't have a graphic designer, like it was <laughs> just, we were making it up as we went along. But what we had was the music industry. And I remember watching a Kickstarter campaign roll out, and it was a band, I don't remember the name, and they were like raising 25 grand. And we were watching like Hawks, and Kickstarter had just executed beautifully. And you could tell they'd raised a lot more money than we had, and on and on. And I didn't know Yancey at the time. I didn't know um, uh, Slava from Indiegogo. Actually, I knew Slava, but, but didn't know Yancey. And um, this project starts going wrong. And the band The one is, that you're watching on Kickstarter. Yeah, and the band is like sitting there saying, there's 20,000 of you on Facebook. If each of you give a dollar, we can make it. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you giving money? Like, you could see the, 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 the band losing their shit. <laughs> and I was like, we got to avoid that. We can't do that. We can't show the target amount. We can't show the financial amount. Because if we show that, then you're going to benchmark the quality of the artist against the revenue that you see. Well, and, you, human, and you're set up for failure. Yeah, because the human brain is, is programmed to look at that number and assign a value to it. So the first few campaigns launched showing the dollar amount, but then we quickly changed that. There are multiple reasons for doing it. But the other reason was is watching Kickstarter execute, I knew that we were going to be outmaneuvered in the other verticals. I just knew it. I was like, these guys are too good. If we focus on music, we can own it. Having Malcolm on, on team as a, as a co-founder was it, you know, I mean, like, he said, who do you want in the room? And I, well, I really like in this Tina Dico album. And he has her in the room like a, a, a uh -huh. week later. And he was the one that I've learned the most about the music industry from in the sort of how it operates. And we would sit up in these meetings. We were like, we, we were, you know, four of us in this, in this basement office next to a rehearsal room. So you couldn't use the room for like big swath of the day as the, uh, I forget the band that was rehearsing in there now. And we would be crying with laughter at the end of the night. It's like we'd have a meeting with a manager and he'd look at us like we were from another planet. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. You sell the music before you've made it. Yeah. And then you deliver it. It's like, what for? I'm like, because you'll make more money. So this what for is a major piece of it. And I mean, I, I'll just lay out for you all of my misgivings. Before you give me some credit. Yes, <laughs> before I concede that it was brilliant. A big part of it for me was the ego of, of having to, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to go ask. And, and if I do ask, I think maybe in my career I'll, I'll have one ask in my life. Yeah. So when I'm ready to go and make my record in Abbey Road with strings, that's when I'm going to ask. But I'm not going to ask just for my next record. Why would I yeah. do that? So I guess I, I positioned the question as I'm asking for something as opposed to I'm giving something. I think sure. that, that was the first thing. The second thing was, as a developing artist, and I, mean, I think probably mm. not far from the way you describe yourself in terms yeah. of size of mailing list, kind of draw, it's one thing. I mean, today when you look at Pledge Music, you have very established artists who have a good relationship with their fans who would yeah. love to be involved. Yeah. That's a sort of an easier campaign to understand because those are clearly defined fans, mm. where in the developing artist world what I see is people who ultimately are turning to their friends and family. Yeah. And that was an uncomfortable sure. piece of it as well. Yeah. And I also felt, wrongly, <laughs> that somehow it would take musicians further away from a life in professional yeah. music yeah. and would make them more like dilettantes. Yeah. And it turns out all three of those are absolutely misguided. Yeah. The first thing, and I'd like to hear you speak to this, that I've come to understand is that repeat campaigns engage fans more deeply. Yep. The second and third campaigns yep. tend to earn higher than the first yep. campaigns do. It's true, yeah. Many artists have made pledge mu music records and then license them or sold them to labels. Absolutely. It does not remove them yeah. from the professional world. It anchors yeah. them more deeply in the world. Yeah. And fans love the experience of being a part of a project. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because when I look at the platform now, the only assumption I got wrong 
like truly wrong. The only big assumption that I got wrong was assumptions. The first one was that it would take longer to convince people. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be so simple once they saw the revenue, but it wasn't. And the second assumption was how much fans would spend. I modeled it originally at the average, the people putting in a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Malcolm, our co-founder, who said, no, 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 not, not less than 10. Benchmark it at 10. The price of an album, the price of the experience. If you're not going to deliver a $10 experience, we're the wrong home for you. And that was a bold move because Kickstarter was crushing it in these dollar, uh -huh. dollar in, who cares, you know? And it's a very different, very different point of view. All I did was I thought like a fan. And Bob Moz from, you know, ex-Twitter, now at Techstars, he coined this phrase, think like a fan. And that's what I was doing. I was sitting there saying, I love Tina Dico's album. Wouldn't it be cool to watch her make a new one? And lo and behold, Malcolm brings Tina Dico into our office and I watch her make an album and it's fucking awesome. And I come back with, whoa, that's what I want. And I paid 100 euros to do something cool, whatever it was. And we put flyers on every seat in the show. Like we went early, like we did everything we could to kind of make it a big success. But what was wild was the percept. So after this chat we're having, I have to sit with a marketing company who was trying to convince their artists to not do a pledge campaign because the, of the optics. Because they're like, well, you yeah. know, you know, big artists don't really do that anymore. And I'm like, we had 160 top 20 albums in 2015 and probably 210 this year. We've got X number of Grammy nominations. I'm like, what about this is not the future? And the other thing that really changed was, and I'm thankful for this, and any entrepreneurs listening or whatever you're thinking is, I had Kickstarter and Indiegogo in a venture-backed battle with each other for the, for the space, and we got the middle ground. And so what we got to do was get good at music, to figure out that, that you know, I, I was like, why would a manager care what their billboard chart position is? What, what is the point of it? We're not in a sales economy anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you're benchmarking your number one at 19,000 records, mm -hmm. what's the point? I don't mm -hmm. get it. What I had to learn was, well, that's all of it. That's perception. Yes. I had the number one album in the country. I just reeled off a stat to you, right? That like, and what was funny was when we got our first number one, or our, yeah. fir our first top 10, I remember, our first top 10 in the US, was Ben Folds. <laughs> oh. I was like jumping up and down about it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it was number one, it was, it was top 10, number 10 with Sony. Yeah. Sony was the label. All the London team were like, oh, now you like the charts. Yeah. You, you know, this, and we were having this good joke. But at the time, I could never have predicted the embrace of the industry, but what I knew was artists were going to struggle to sell units. No matter what happened, we were going into a streaming world. And so if you can't extract money out of the unit itself, mm -hmm. where do you get it? Yeah. And I've said this before, I'll say it again, which is that fans don't need more ways to buy anything. They need reasons. And in some instances, the existence of the album is a reason not to buy it because it's a known quantity. You know, it's a bit like if you knew the ending of the movie, yeah. you're kind of like, well, I know, I know what happens now. Whereas if you start the sale during the making, like a reality TV show, you know, when the bass player fucks the drummer's girlfriend or boyfriend, or you know, all the shit that goes down when you're in the studio, when that happens, it's an open canvas. Why would you reveal the album artwork to everybody? Why not reveal it to those who bought it? And so the industry reached a point where I was, you know, I mean, you know, Rob Wells at Universal and I were sitting down one night, one day, and he's like, well, okay, prove it to me. I'll give, you, I'll give you three bands. You got three shots, prove it to me. I'm like, bring it on. And we did. And what was interesting was going back to him and he said, oh, I get it makes more money. Well, it the, does, and, you know. the, and the other thing from those labels who are interested in chart position is that when you pre-sell a record, it contributes to the first week's sales, yep. which is what they're all focused exactly. on. Exactly. So these and records come out charting. you have more time. So conventional marketing says wind it up to a point and then everything relies on that week one. And it also relies on the record being good mm -hmm. and palatable to radio. So there's a, there's a hundred disintermediating factors between the music itself and its success. Part of this reimagines the role as being active as opposed to passive, I guess on both sides, right? Because as a fan, what we expect from our artists is that they reach out to us, that they in some way include us in the process and they give us an opportunity to reach back and yep. be included. So how does this change the kinds of people who can be successful in this model. There's no one that isn't successful in this model. You just have to benchmark what success is. 
One of the things I've learned about, about starting a company is you've got to know what success looks like, but most importantly, what failure looks like. And so the conventional wisdom of marketing a record or marketing a video, whatever it was, is get it to the widest amount of people yeah. possible because 20% of them are your cash cow. And ironically, Mark Mulligan published research which said that 17% of music consumers are super fans. That 17%, they are 61% of all the revenue. Now, it's way fucking easier to, find, to them. Con find them than it is to find everybody else. But if you throw everything out wide and you don't give the super fans anything to do, they cannot show up. The literal pieces of what you need to make money, these fans, these girls and guys will pay for. But they can't if you send them to Spotify. They can't if you send them to SoundCloud. If you send them to a house that you do not own, they pay that other person rent. So churches could have had 65 bucks, my email address, my address, my phone number, and a way to sell me anything that they do. Instead, title is the only way I know what churches are doing. Mm -hmm. Now I could go and sign up for their social network, but then Edrank is going to say that I might not see the posts. Yes. So they have to pay to see for me to see what, what I would you want, want to see. Yeah. What a lot of time we had to do was explain that, like, we are. This is how records are going to be put out. This is how. This is what the consumption process. Like, if it goes to streaming, you're okay if you can get fifty-five dollars per fan. Sure. A thousand fans is fifty-five thousand dollars a year before they've heard the music. Then you sell the music. Then you offer the you know on and on. So. I think four years ago, maybe three years ago, we did a study with Nielsen. Nielsen studied our user base, their own user base in South By. And we presented this big thing at South By. And it basically said that there's between a half a billion and $2.6 billion in found money if the music industry adopted direct-to-fan as part of its release. Mm -hmm. Right now you have how many registered users? A few million, you know, uh, and about 30,000 artists. But the key was... We presented this, it wasn't us, it was Nielsen, the benchmark of how they get the charts, saying, do you want half a billion bucks? All you gotta do is offer signed vinyl test pressings and the making of. Like, we, we literally, we asked the questions, what would you pay for, how much would you pay? And they told us. The average Pledge Music user spends $1,000 a year on music. Mm. But here's the thing, they can't spend $1,000 a year, because the maximum they can spend is $120 on a streaming service, mm -hmm. right? Yep. On one streaming service, and then the odd show. Yeah. We've literally cut off and crippled their ability to spend more money. Now, there's multiple reasons why that's happening. But what I would say to any artist is, would you rather have 1,000 people listen to your music on Spotify, or would you rather have 100 people pledge 55 bucks each and, and a thousand people listen to your music on Spotify. It's not either or. Yeah. But on one path, you get to have that first run of CDs, that first run of vinyl, the first merch run paid for, the studio time paid for. And the other thing is, is it's easier to reach your first few hundred fans than it is to reach your first 10,000. Mm -hmm. Because those 10,000 become harder by virtue of the fact that you've got gatekeepers of social networks and, and on and on. In this, this meeting I'll have later on today, I saw what they were proposing. Give away a track for free on SoundCloud because you want to get into that community. And I, and I said to the manager, what is the return on attention for that? Your artist is about to shine their spotlight on SoundCloud. What do you get in return? Well, more plays. No, what does that get you? Tell me how much money that makes you. How much does that SoundCloud user equal to your bottom line for the next five years or 10 years of that artist's life? Well, it doesn't work that way. Well, tell me how it fucking works then. Right. It's not bad to go on SoundCloud. It's not bad to go on Spotify. It's amazing. But if you send me to Spotify when I want a piece of signed vinyl, you're an idiot because I'll listen to it on Spotify anyway. Well, that's what I'm hearing you say yeah. again and again, is it doesn't negate the existing business. Yeah. It adds value to the business. This leads me to a piece of it that I think yeah. initially differentiated you from the competition. I mean, I like the way you say you had these two venture capital-based businesses that were sort of battling for the edges and you found yourself in the middle. Yeah. But one thing, especially when you're operating on a scale like that, that you're not really able to do that Pledge does do is it interacts much more directly with the artist. I know you're not a label and you've made it very clear that you don't see yourself as a yep. label. However, you do behave as a and &R under certain conditions. You yep. do certain things that used to exist in the label yep. world. Look at the market and see what's happening. Yep. You also advise artists to a certain degree as a manager or a yep. project manager would in terms of identifying what targets are possible to hit and how to define, as you say, what success yep. looks like. 
And I, it seems to me that if publishing the target was setting people up for failure, you're interested in setting artists up for success. Yeah. It, it yeah. sets you up for success yeah. as well. If we tied our fates to the artist, then we couldn't fuck it up. And one of the things that's interesting was is um, the artists own all their data, not just so they can fulfill, but also because it's, to me, it's their, their digital gold. It means that if we suck at campaign management, at fulfillment, at all these things, they can take all of their information and go somewhere else, including the other bands that they brought to the table. And I like that accountability. It's scary, but you need to be scared because you've got to be always doing the right thing. As I said, you know, because things can be excellent, they have to be. Mm -hmm. It really was ingrained. And we, we just want to see this creator class of people have their own data, their own root, that means that you can do something weird and eclectic and strange and it still finds a market. Yeah. Because in a, in a mass consumption model, that doesn't really happen. No. You know, if you're doing a thousand listens on Spotify, it just doesn't do anything. I was on the phone with a guy the other day and he's like, you know, this artist is doing really well. It's in two million streams on, on Spotify. And I said, great. So how much has, this, has she made? Oh, it's about $6,000. I'm like, that's not going to work for a year. That economic model doesn't work. Oh, but they'll do shows and they'll do other stuff. I said, how? With what? How do you seed the show? Yeah. How, do you, how do you get, how do you get people four there? or five people on the road? You know, like, I've done it. I, I went into massive debt to do it. And, and everything I took into this as a business was I've never said to an artist anything I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. And when an artist says, oh, that sounds really hard to me, I'm like, no, bartending is hard. Driving Uber because you're not doing what you want to do every day, that's hard. So would you rather drive Uber and do bartending to pay for the studio session or have the fans pay for it and supplement? There's an expression, no one lies in their deathbed wishing they spent more time at the office. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be amended. Why? No one lies in their deathbed wishing they'd spent more time at somebody else's office. Benji Rogers on making sure you're spending time in the right office. You think you've got it hard? Try bartending. And then, in Benji's case, stop bartending. In fact, stop hanging around bars altogether. Since creating Pledge, Benji has gone on to start other music companies, most recently a project called Dot Blockchain Music, which seeks to reshape the way music rights are communicated and shared digitally. He lays it out as concisely as possible in the interview, and once again, just as he was that first time we met, he speaks passionately, enthusiastically, and somewhat obsessively about why this will work and why it must work. Whatever my reservations may be, unlike last time, this time around I'm giving Benji Rogers the benefit of the doubt. To start out this final segment of our conversation, we talk about the importance of getting sober to Benji's success, in staying focused, weathering the ups and downs of startup life, and being responsible for other people's money. He also explains why you have to be a little crazy to get into this kind of thing. But as he says, you have to be a little bit crazy to get into music, too. So do you think this would have happened if you hadn't gotten sober? No, I'd be dead. Uh, the alcoholic brain tends to be extremely active. And what I realized was I would, I would have all these ideas, but I would be too into the bar, too into the, the kind of thing. And so when you quit drinking, um, you don't have the sugar rush, you don't have the late night, you know, you have, there's no excuse. And so the first thing you come up against is, is that your brain won't shut down, it doesn't stop. And I poured all of it into Pledge. And the other thing that I realized was, and not everyone has a problem, right? like, like, you know, I, I did. I know people who have problems who should probably quit, but they won't. But they've got one common feature, which is that they're literally obsessive, go get it done people. So on Pledge End, I remember realizing uh, I almost canceled a meeting with Malcolm, my co-founder, because I was too hungover. And I remember sitting there, and he said off, he was like, you stank of gin, like you stank yeah. you know, pretty bad, you know, because I was really, I was like green, ready to throw up. And I, and I remember, like, I've got this credit card with a bigger balance than I could ever spend. I've got too much at stake now. I can build something. And um, in, in, in AA, there's a wonderful expression, which is when what you've lost or are about to lose means more to you than drinking. And I was about to lose it, like I could feel it slipping away. So I remember going to my first meeting to, to get sober and um, being like, oh, this isn't so hard, you know, like, like this isn't so bad. And what I found was I just had energy and time. And I realized, well, I'm not at the pub or the bar anymore. I, I get home and I'm like, I can watch TV, but I'll go nuts. I, I want to work. 
and then it gets too much. Then you can be a workaholic, right? Yes. So you got to balance it out really well. I'm, I'm very happy to speak openly about sobriety because it's the best thing that ever happened. I would take back those hours and hours I had just sitting there kind of, you know, slowly losing the plot on, you know, look amazing cocktails. Like if I thought to myself, Benji, you'll never drink an 85 Cheval Blanc again or uh, an 82 Chateau Margaux or a Lefroy or a, uh, you know, a Glen Morangi in a Portwood barrel, that would drive me a little nuts. At the same time, I'd rather build and solve a problem, you know, so, so you, 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 you trade off, right? And now that I'm a father, um, I can't imagine waking up hungover and just not being there for my daughter. Um, and at the same time, my passion for building, my passion for solving the problems is infinitely more rewarding than its opposite. And, you know, I know a bunch of musicians who will say, ah, oh, but, you know, I need it to be in the mood. No, you don't. You don't. The, the creativity is inside. You, you dig deep for it and you pull it out. I know amazing sober musicians and amazing drunk musicians. <laughs> you know, I know musicians who are trying to shut down because it's too overwhelming. Yes. I'm in that camp. My brain was going nuts. I didn't sleep. I mean, I had to, I had to like, you know, slowly calm the brain down. I had to do, you know, exercises. What do you do to calm the brain down? Um, I do a, I do a 20 minute meditation every day, uh, every morning when I wake up, and I <laughs> have an app that benchmarks how many times I do it. You know, um, and then I focus by clearly writing out my goals and intentions for the day, focusing on what has to be done, and saying by the end of the day I'm going to have achieved this, this, and this. And do you hit it every day? No, I mean. I have a good average. I have a good average. I mean, I've, I've, I've done my kind of quiet time meditation, I'd say, every day, but maybe three for the last two and a half years. It doesn't matter what it is, you just need a method for handling it. Uh, an entrepreneur who I advise, he, he, he pinged me and he's like, how do you deal with the ups and downs? How do you deal with the loneliness of that? And I said, what do you mean, how do you deal with it? That's what it is. It's the same as when you're a musician, you know? Are they gonna show up tonight? Are they going to get, you know, am I going to yeah. be able to come up with the goods? Yes. You're, you're always on a razor blade, you know, on the edge of a razor blade. But we don't go in to do things that are easy. Many of us have been in a situation where when you are about to walk on to that gig one more time and you don't feel yeah. the panic or the fear or the possibility of failure, you know something's not right. Yeah. Something's not working right. I, I get like a swimming feeling in my yeah. stomach. But I remember when I got calm about playing shows... It wasn't ever a calm. It was just kind of like I was muscle memory. Like, yes. like, like, like you know, and that's, that, that's the best place to be as a musician. Yeah. When you get into, the, into, into the, the, the entrepreneurial world, when you become, like, like I sat with a, with a guy I advised today, one of his companies, one of my companies that I advised, and he was like telling me this problem. And I said, I said, stop. This deal's no good. It's no good. No, but, and I said, no, no, no there's no buts. I've seen this play out five times. This never works in your favor. Mm -hmm. This is why you're not being respected, you're not being honored, you're not being honored and honored like this. You bring more to the table than this. Artists sign bad deals all the time. And I keep saying, you know, and, and once you've seen enough of them, you're just like, it's like how many times do you have to get whacked over the yes. head? And the answer is, there's a bunch. Yes. Because we're, we're thick-headed creatures, right? But what I found was, is the sobriety has given me a, the world has sharpened to a point, you mm -hmm. know, like, like musicians have a unique way of looking at it. I think it comes from the studio. So when, you're in, when you walk in the studio and you've got an acoustic guitar demo, your brain is continuously processing what it will sound like at mix down. If you're an engineer, you can sit there and say, I gotta have the snare at this level because otherwise it's gonna interfere with the vocal here. And you're building mentally models. You're modeling out what you're gonna have to do because you know you gotta get the fucking drummer to, to sober up so he can keep time, or else you gotta work, you know, get machines to help him keep yeah. time for him. And having done that enough times, I can sit there and say, this is what it looks like on a piece of paper, that's what it'll look like when it's deployed. So you see tech development, being an entrepreneur business as a kind of extension of being in the studio. Yeah, it's painting, it's painting on a different canvas. The canvas of, of, of a Pro Tools layout, you know, the, the canvas of the Gantt chart mm -hmm. is basically sitting there saying, I gotta put the pieces in place. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just different things. iOS and Android, you know, is, is the new frickin' reverb or the new, you know, sound but replacer. Or what whatever. I see about you in the way you describe booze and music and tech is you are obsessive yep. about whatever it is. Yep. 
right? I mean, that you want to know everything and, and you get excited about all of the minutiae and the yeah. details. And I mean, I don't know if that's something that you recognize as a trait among successful entrepreneurs or uh, uh, successful musicians, or if that's just something specific I to mean, you. I mean, I'm an avid reader, and yet my spelling and punctuation is appalling because I left high school when I was 15, so I have to have someone check my blogs. And, and you know, like I look back at my tweets and they're all spelled wrong like this. Like, it's just, I'm, the dyslexia makes it difficult, mm -hmm. but you need something in your own way. You need it. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need it. It's funny, m my friend, uh, my co-founder, Rupert, I always make this joke about him. I'm like, I'm like, you can't ever make life easy for him. He's at his best when he's struggling against mm -hmm. something, you know? I think a lot, some artists are that way. Yes, I think so too. So you, I think, are probably a great songwriter and a great musician. Do you think you were a greater business guy than you were yeah, an artist? I am. Um, the the thing that I've that I've noticed it, it's funny. I I gave a talk the other day, and it was in front of probably a couple hundred people. And the thought occurred to me that this is more than I ever performed in front of when I was a musician. I miss it in a big way. I miss being a musician. I miss that part. But what I realized was is that I'm painting on a different canvas, and I've created three, four companies, all in the service of getting artists paid, mm -hmm. because. I don't want artists to quit. I'm watching my friends who've gotten bad record deals. I'm watching my friends stop because it's too hard. And it's always been hard. It's, it's, it's not like it's not just a given, like, oh yeah, here you go, you're a musician now. It's always been hard. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel. You don't have that same light anymore. If you're looking at twenty twenty thousand dollars a year in, in streaming revenue if you're getting six million streams, you know, like eight million streams. I just want artists to have that shot, that leg up, that they can go, there's a fan base here for you. Think of how many records this week are gonna come out straight to streaming with no chance to make the money. Not even a shot at it that were made a year ago, two years ago, that could have been monetized in the whole time, building up that footprint. And this is really where, where ours is like, and I stand by it, relatively soon it will be it will seem absurd to create something and then sell it. Well, and I've heard you say that the creation of a product is m more compelling than yeah. the product itself. Because, it, the, because it's uncertain. Because you reveal the artwork, you reveal the lyrics, you reveal the first track, you reveal the video. You've all, all, it's a series of reveals. Right, it's an experience. And most people don't get to go in studios and watch, watch artists make it. Yeah. And what an artist takes for granted as day to day is fascinating to those who don't do it. And we, we can't lose sight of that. Most humans don't do what they love for a living. Mm -hmm. And so when they watch someone truly go for it, it's inspiring to them. Yeah. You won't see any of that in 90% of releases. <laughs> because they'll say, well, we do direct a fan. We, we, we've got a storefront with a bunch of bundles. It's not about the bundles. Bundles are great. They make you good money. We, we survive on bundles. And yet at the same time, it's about that video where it goes, I'm, I'm going out and recording sounds in nature to bring onto the new album. What do you think of these harmonies? Quick shot of the harmonies. You know, like, all those little pieces are what I love and I would pay for. Mm -hmm. Most of the artists I love will not allow me to give them money. Yeah. They will literally have said, no, 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 please, no money from you, we don't want it. I would like for you to go and pay Spotify and have the money come through to somehow trickle back to me in the end. That's how I want you to support me. You know what? Your wish is granted. I just briefly want to touch on blockchain yeah. because that seems to be your solution to the reality of streaming yep. and looking at trying to change the, another uh, aspect of the model of, of the way we listen to music and the way music yeah. is licensed and, yeah. and sold. So basically if Pledge was the first mile, which was the solving of monetizing an artist when they're making something, then dot blockchain is the last mile. As I started to look at the files that were being uploaded to us to, to distribute to fans, I realized there's no metadata in here. So I could take a release and I could go Apple I and amend all of the all the information in the song. And then worse than that, I watched Spotify get into a big lawsuit with David Lowry over I think 37 copyrights because they didn't get a correct license. And then I started to notice like, well, why does my ASCAP statement just say an amount of money? What's it for? Sound exchange, what's it for? Like, like show yeah. me how I'm breaking this down. How do I pay the other musicians? I don't know what, I don't know what songs. And so as I started to look, I realized that A, 
there's no place to permanently store metadata in a public space. B, there's no place to look up who owns what anywhere. So even if you try to do the right thing, it's impossible. The publishers are relying on a, on a, on a, on a file format from like the, the 80s. Everybody's holding their own data. They're yeah. not talking to each and, other. And so w when, when I first read about blockchain, I remember just going like, wait a second. If you can create a digitally permanent record, then what you can create from that is digital scarcity. And what that means is you can say there's a limited edition of this album, a digital limited oh. edition. Because what you can do is you can program the song to no longer exist. And, but but it, it relied on two concepts, and this is the bit that, that's difficult about blockchain. Blockchain creates a digitally permanent record of something because you cannot ever delete it because all the computers in the network confirm this event. So what you can do with that is you can say, this is the, the proof of who owns it. So if you can take the publisher or writer and the master owner and push them together and then lock them into a, a blockchain entry, you've won. But this was the problem. How does that entry equal the music I hear? Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about the nature of copyright. So to fix in a tangible form, what's tangible about an MP3 that I've told ASCAP about but they don't know what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. How would they know when that one's used? Which is why my statement says usage, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, what we did was I had this idea in the shower, which is like, <laughs> why don't we take the song and bundle it with its metadata? And every time that metadata changes, if it's a new entry, it stripes the blockchain with that truth. Right, so it's dynamic. Publishing Correct. can be reassigned, masters can be reassigned. Correct. And you do so by a series of tagging. So you're in the studio and you, go, you, you try to export a song, and you see MP3, Wave, ACC, you know, whatever it is, and you can affix metadata there. In the future, you go to export, and it says export as .bc, which will contain all those formats and the ability to permission them uh -huh. to various parties. So you parties. don't need to, this was a part of, big part of my question, you don't need to develop a new compression format. Correct. You can attach a BC to any existing compression Correct. format. And so what happens is, let's say, so, so, you, so if I said, hey, Leo, can you send me a copy of the song? Yeah. You'd say, sure, export as .bc. The one thing you would have to do that's different in your workflow now is you'd have to enter in the writer information, the performer information, the song title, and then you send that to me and that stripes the blockchain. And, and what do you I, call it, the minimum? Minimum viable data. Yeah. Then what happens is I get a 200K file with permission to reify it from where you've sent it. Mm -hmm. So think of the song becomes a Google Doc mm -hmm. in which you can see the change log of ownership, mm -hmm. you can assign people in permissions, mm -hmm. and then when you're going to ready to, to, to distribute, Spotify and YouTube and Tidal and on and on will say, this is the data threshold we need. Yeah. So you get to build the song to that data threshold, out it goes. But when you change the, the publisher information, every PRO on earth can see that. Yes. When you change it, the label, so when you reassign rights, when you add a co-writer, yeah. it's, it's, it's basically applying the logic of a Facebook photograph tag mm -hmm. to, a, to a Google Doc containing music. <laughs> but if you remove the music, it doesn't, doesn't work because you can't put the music anywhere in the absence of creating this, this thing. You know, this is so fascinating to me, and obviously it brings with it an enormous amount of baggage because of all of the pre-existing content that's out there already. I mean, you actually have to reshape the way people think about a lot of the protocols there's that are carrot, established. There's a carrot, which is data transparency, greater interoperability, but there's also a stick. And the stick is, you're, you've written songs, right? And you're a creator. So when you go into this .bc ecosystem, you say export as .bc and you tag your PRO and you tag your publisher and you tag your label. They are under an obligation to accept the tag, which makes it the truth, mm -hmm. disagree with the tag, in which case you dispute till you fix it. Mm -hmm. If they ignore the tag, it's the truth. So in a blockchain world, they have to show up to answer the call. Otherwise, someone else can You're come in and miss do out it. on it. Um, Tim Berners-Lee talked about this as the, 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 the semantic web, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and what I think we're looking at here is a scenario in which the song can achieve its maximum interoperability if the parties to the song can agree. Otherwise, they just can't agree because they're not dealing with a common framework. And all I'm saying is you could not get a song into Spotify without the first writer right. in it because the first writer leads to every other writer. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience with Pledge mm. and the other uh, successes that you've had, blockchain seems attainable to you? It seems doable? There's no other way to do it. 
There's no other method that will work. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. One of the things I always counsel um, uh, when I talk to young entrepreneurs or young artists yeah. is I say to them, if you have an idea, you have to create the mental model in which the world is an absurdity in the absence of it. And this is where I got to a pledge. I, I remember saying to the team early on, I said, do you realize how fucking insane the world is in which 22,000 albums a month are being released mm -hmm. and I've not been able to spend any money on them? That, like, you, have, you have to say, so, so the world is an insane, chaotic place in the absence of dot blockchain because how do you know who owns what? This is the rails that we're going to build. Enough smart people that I know have kind of come onto the idea. I'm at the edge of my technical limit every single day. But in my mind, it's built. Now it's just about deployment. And um, in the same way that the pledge was built the second I had it in my head. Be I mean, I hesitate to ask this question, but the voice in my head is saying, do you have to be a little crazy yeah. to you do this? But you have to be crazy to be a musician. You have to be crazy to create anything. Because the odds are always stacked against you. Today, we have to create a global a set of rails and standards on which our music can interact. There's no other way. Because otherwise, as artists, we will submit our work to these massive players and they will set the rules. And what I believe is we should fuck submission of my work. I'm going to offer you my work. These are the terms. You want it. It's yours. Otherwise, I don't have time. We need to take that control back as creators and artists. And we need to sit there and say, these are the terms. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. We still do a label deal, still do a publishing deal. It doesn't change anything. But I think that ownership should be built into the song. The genetics of the song should be who wrote it, who created it, and their intentions for it. Mm -hmm. Digi to digitally express your rights in a permanent place is an unparalleled moment. And it couldn't have happened three years ago because blockchain was not there. Right. You need something that cannot be owned. And, and this is and, and it can't live in any yeah. one place. And when you look at what decentralization is, it is the most radical and fundamental shift we are about to see across not only the content space, but voting and financial regulations and insurance and all the things, you know, so we are sitting on it. We haven't seen where this goes. Because remember, blockchain is, is A, a method of you know, sending commerce, but it's also a message, a means of communication. But you're communicating a message that will live forever mm -hmm. in a public place. That sounds really obvious. Graffiti on a wall doesn't live forever in a right. public place because you knock that building down, it goes away. If the network of a blockchain gets big enough, where you've got 18,000, 100,000, 200,000 computers running nodes, how do you take that down? The internet is what, 27 supercomputers, I think it is, all over the world? Hmm. That's our global infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Networks of you know, massive yeah. banks of computers. Yeah. Picture if all of a sudden we distribute that across yeah. hundreds of thousands of computers. Yes. Ethereum is, 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 is going along this way. So we're going to see an absolute fundamental change, and it will happen really fucking fast. I mean, just to wrap up, I have to say, it seems completely overwhelming. It's daunting. I don't know how to wrap my mind around it, but considering how I felt the last time we spoke about a new idea, <laughs> I'm, very the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> I'm very confident that you're going to pull it off. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Benji. There it was, Benji Rogers. Think like a fan. Know what success looks like. Be a little crazy. Bartending is hard. Great stuff. Oh, man. If you liked this conversation, check out my previous episodes with music business author Ari Herstand, producer Matt Pearson, and Peter Keckley of Upworthy. Visit third-story for all your third story podcast needs and drop me a line, leave a review, subscribe, get involved. I tweet at Leo Sidrin. Facebook is at Third Story Podcast. I'll be back next week with another great conversation. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.